how to get started with personal finance. It's very, very simple. There's only four things you need to do. So you need to increase your income and you need to reduce your spending as much as you can without reducing your quality of life. And you need to start investing in something sensible and you need to have the appropriate insurance for your situation. And if you can do those four things, even a little, it'll make a huge difference to your life over time. こんにちは、皆さん。ビジネス・サクセス・ジャパンのポッドキャストへようこそ。Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Business Success Japan podcast. This is your host, Liddy Buchelman. This podcast is made for those who want to develop or strengthen the communication skills, cultural savvy, insights into current trends and conditions, and mindsets that are essential in a Japanese business environment. The helpful, practical suggestions and engaging insights offered here provide listeners with the in depth cultural context needed to achieve their own version of success while collaborating with Japanese counterparts. Today, I have the pleasure of sharing a conversation that I had with Ben Sheeran, or Tanaka, his married name. Ben was a university lecturer in Sendai who retired from formal work in March 2022. He has been in Japan since July 2000 and has run the Retire Japan website since 2013. Retire Japan is the best and quite possibly only place to find trustworthy information in English on personal finance, investing, and retirement in Japan, with a wealth of free information and a supportive online community. Be sure to keep listening to hear more about his insights into what you can do to improve your financial health and set you up for future success and stability while living in Japan. Thanks for inviting me today. I'm quite excited to be here.、Uh, so, my name's Ben, Ben Sheeran most of the time, Ben Tanaka sometimes. That's my married name.、Uh, I think I'm here because I started Retire Japan in 2013. So, I've been working as an English teacher in Japan since 2000. I came in July 2000 on the JET program. S- was sent to Sendai. I'd never heard of Sendai before. But、uh, I was like, okay, Sendai sounds good. <laughs> And it turned out to be great because it's, it's one of my favorite places in Japan. Uh, and I've been here ever since. And basically, through a series of unfortunate events, I got very interested in personal finance、uh, in around 2008. And then around tw- 2013, I started Retire Japan because I thought I'd like to share the things I've learned with people that live in Japan, but maybe would be better off with information in English rather than information in Japanese. So that's why we're here. We're here to spread the word about. Being financially responsible in Japan in English. Right. Definitely valuable to know in any country, but in Japan, that threshold to get good information is definitely quite a bit higher if Japanese is not your first language. So, this should be a great discussion. So, then, why did you decide to come to Japan on the JET program? Well, I'd always been interested in Japan. And I came very close to studying Japanese at university, but I ended up studying Chinese instead because I thought Chinese would be more useful. Professionally.、Um, and then I came and lived in Japan. So <laughs> go figure. <laughs> But I still wanted to kind of, you know, I spent a, a year and a half in China studying and so on as part of the university course. But I still wanted to come to Japan. And at the turn of the millennium, Japan still had this image of being really expensive. So as a student, I was like, I couldn't possibly afford to travel to Japan. So obviously, I'm going to have to go and work there instead if I want to. You know, see it. So, the, the original plan was maybe two years in Japan, and then I'd go back to the UK and、uh, find a real job, as it were. <laughs> yeah, I hear that quite a bit where you plan to stay for two years and it ends up being 20, 30, it just keeps going. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. This is just my kind of impression, but my impression is that the people that didn't really They weren't that excited about living in Japan, end up staying. And the ones that, you know, their dream was to come here end up leaving after a year or two. It can't live up to the expectations kind of thing. Whereas if you come here and you're like, yeah, it's just another country, and you kind of fall in love with the place and end up staying.、So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure. So then, can you tell us a little bit more about kind of what brought you to your personal finance journey, the series of unfortunate events that you mentioned before? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, I've never been particularly good with money. I was quite spendy in my teens and 20s. You know, I'd, I'd like spend my paycheck by week three of the month and then kind of run around eating cup ramen and borrowing money from people. But I got married and I had stepkids.、Um, we were living in this big house and I was working for the Board of Education as a supervisor. So I was the ALT supervisor and kind of 
English education consultant type in Miyagi. And I was on a one year rolling contract. Uh, and the deal when I was hired was, you know, you're on a one year contract and you can basically stay as long as you like. You know, as long as you know everything's fine. And uh, we got to, I was four years in, it was two, late 2007, and Miyagi decided to go with dispatch ALTs instead of the JET program. So obviously at that point, they didn't really need an ALT supervisor anymore. So I got called into a meeting in November with my boss, and they were like, ah, yes, um, we're not going to renew your contract next year in April. So good luck. And Sendai is not that big in terms of job prospects. So finding a full-time job with decent salary in November for the next year was, was pretty it was a pretty tall order. So I called my wife up and uh, she kind of collapsed. <laughs> I was like, we don't have any money. You know, How are we going to pay the rent? Um, and that was an incredibly stressful few months. So I managed to put together some part-time work. I was teaching part-time at universities and things. But um, really unpleasant. And I came out of that situation with kind of two realizations. The, so the first one, was, this, is, this is actually my fault because... You know, I'm not in a position of financial strength. So the fact that this happened is is my responsibility. And the other thing is I don't want this to happen ever again. So, so <laughs> that's when I started, you know, reading and uh, trying to learn and trying different things. And uh, that's where it started. So the, the kind of focus on personal finance. So growing the income, reducing the spending, investing the money somehow to make it work. And yeah, by a few years later, I kind of had a good grasp on things. And then I had a conversation with a friend. So a friend of mine was working in Tokyo as an English teacher. Lovely, lovely guy, like the nicest person ever. And he was telling me about his retirement plans because he's a bit older than me. And uh, he'd signed on with one of these advisors in Tokyo. You know, the kind of people that call you up at lunchtime and are like, hey, I'd like to talk to you about investing. And the more he told me about his his kind of plan and, and I just got more and more angry. So, so I went home and started Retire Japan that very day. I wrote the first blog post, registered the site and sent it into the world. And since then, we've just kind of grown organically. Yeah, thanks for digging into that a little bit for us. But just based on your own experience, are there any things that you wish you had done before your experience losing your job that would have put you in a better position other than obviously hopefully having a emergency fund already set aside. But is there anything else that you'd wish you'd done to prepare? Oh, so much. So, <laughs> so much stuff. I mean, basically everyone who starts investing wishes they'd started 10 years earlier because you'd have 10 years more experience, more money, more compounding. Like if I'd started when I was 21 instead of 31, you know, I would be living on some island that I owned at this point, you know. <laughs> so, but on the other hand, maybe no, because it's all part of the journey. So I've made all sorts of mistakes with money and investing, you know, constantly. But it's all part of your learning experience. So without making the mistakes, would you be the same person today? Probably not. And I kind of actually recently I wrote a, a thing about you know focusing on the present or focusing on the future and and basically when I was young I focused pretty much on the present only but there are good good aspects to that so you you have experiences and you kind of enjoy life um, and obviously there's there's problems if you don't focus enough on the future but I, I think it was it worked out quite well for me so I had a, I had a good time in my 20s and then I kind of knuckled down in my 30s and now in my 40s I'm trying to figure out where the balance is between those two viewpoints so are you living in the future are you living in the present you know or, or balance of the two so. so then just on a logistical level if you end up in a situation where your contract just isn't renewed are you still eligible for things like unemployment benefits how does that look on a logistic level when you lose your job in that way in japan right yeah so unemployment benefit is paid insurance in japan so if you're working for a I guess a reputable employer, they'll they'll enroll you in Shitsugyo Hoken, which is the unemployment insurance. It's a tiny amount of, you know, it's like a thousand yen a month or something. Um, and whether you're eligible for uh, unemployment benefit depends on how long you've been paying in, uh, as well as the circumstances of your 
job finishing uh, and there's this because basically if you choose to leave your job you have to wait three months to get your benefits if your job is terminated you can get the benefits immediately uh, and the amount you get is based on your monthly salary when you finish working i believe and then the number of months you can claim is based on how long you've paid in also your age it's quite complicated actually uh, I ended up not claiming it because I had part-time work. Uh, and you can claim unemployment insurance if you're working part-time, but it's a real hassle. You've got to submit all sorts of paperwork and, you know, they they basically reduce your benefits by the amount you're earning. And at the end of the day, I, I'm pretty lazy. So I was like, yeah, I'm just not going to bother with this. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're claiming unemployment, you have to go in once or twice a month and kind of pretend to be looking for work and, you know, fill in some paperwork. and. Uh, yeah, I kind of skip. I'm not a fan of government offices. <laughs> and we got by, you know, we got by somehow. So it's all good. But it, that is there if you need it. So, you know, if you did lose your job and you had no other form of income, you would be able to get that kind of support. Some Sometimes you can get um, housing support as well from your local authority. So it's definitely worth going to city office if you're in trouble and being like, okay, what, you know, what, what can you do for me? Um, you don't have to pay your pension if your income falls or if you're in economic problems um so you register and then you can stop paying but you'll still accumulate your pension credits um you can get your health insurance reduced you know there's all sorts of things you can do if you have a sudden drop in income so definitely worth looking into those yeah is there anything else about the pension system in japan specifically that you think people should be aware of well the main thing is that um i, I keep running into people that seem to think that paying into the pension is optional uh, and it's not <laughs> So <laughs> you do have to pay into the pension. Um, it's not enforced as strongly as I'd like it to be, um, but that is changing. So they are starting to enforce it more and more. For example, if you want to apply for permanent residency now, if you're not up to date on your pension, you won't be able to apply. Um, and I'm pretty sure now that with my number and so on, that's that's going to probably go down to all sorts of visa renewals. So in the future, in the near future, I'm guessing that in order to get a visa or renew a visa, you're going to have to show that you're properly paying into social insurance here. And the other thing, I guess, is that people seem quite blasé about having a pension. But I, I talk to people in their 60s that haven't paid in enough, so they won't get a pension. And, and that is a terrible situation to be in. So. Definitely be aware of, you know, how you can get ready for retirement or not being able to work or finishing work or not wanting to work and, and kind of get ready for that. Take steps to to prepare yourself because you don't want to be 67 and, and not have any pension or, or any kind of income because that's not a good place. Definitely think about how you can take care of your future self. So Going back to what you were saying before about back in the day when people believed that Japan was an expensive place before the whole yen situation that we're currently in at the moment as of November 2022, <laughs> it's a little bit different now, but what would you say to people who are concerned about the idea of the cost of living in Japan, or I guess the cost of living as compared to wages in Japan? Ah, well, that's, that's two different things, I think. So when I came to Japan, Japan was expensive compared to the UK, compared to other countries. And the Japanese salary was very attractive. So when I came to Japan, the jet starting salary was 300,000 yen a month. I think it's less than that now. And that was very good. So compared to graduate salaries in the UK with the exchange rate at the time, that was a decent salary. So and Japan felt kind of expensive when I came over, you know, um, but prices haven't changed. So 22 years ago, when I came to Japan, you know, a can of Coke was 120 yen from the vending machine. And, you know, you can get onigiri for 100 yen and a beer was like 500 yen. And it still is. Whereas the UK prices have, you know, trebled since I've been here. Uh, and that's the same for pretty much most countries. So I went to Australia a few years ago. Uh, and after about two days, I was like, I can't afford to exist in this country. It's so expensive. And I think that's true across the board. So Japan is is cheap now. I mean, we used to go to Thailand on holiday. Uh, and the last time we went, it you know, it didn't feel cheap anymore because it was I was converting prices to yen. I was like, oh, OK. So Japan is really. And this was that's before the exchange rate. 
So now with the, I mean, the, the weak yen is is only really weak against the dollar. Because other currencies are also weak against the dollar. The pound, for example, is also fallen quite a bit against the dollar. But yeah, I mean, if you're coming from the US to Japan, it's like <laughs> everything's on sale. So Now wages, though, I think in Japan, wages are still okay. So you can still live on kind of starting salaries and so on. Um, the problem for many people is um, maybe they come here with student debt. You know, and so servicing those loans is getting more and more difficult as the especially at the moment with the weekend. But it, with with these salaries that are basically stagnant, it, it's getting more and more difficult to save money and potentially more and more difficult to move back to your you know, home country or, or a different country. So particularly with Australians, you know, if you've been here for 15 years and you're Australian, you basically cannot go back to Australia because real estate prices and the cost of living is just insane. So that I think is worth bearing in mind if, if you're here temporarily. Are there any things that you think people can do to try to protect against that situation where maybe you were hoping to retire in your home country, but when you actually reach 65, you realize it's just out of your budget. Is there anything people can do before they reach that point to preserve that flexibility or those options? Other than, you know, saving like a maniac and, and investing <laughs> or possibly thinking of a third country, because, you know, there's, there's people that retire to, you know, Central America, for example, very reasonable cost of living compared to the US or, or whatever, but close enough and with expat communities and so on, or Southeast Asia, you know, Thailand, um, Philippines has always been a popular place for people to retire to. Uh, even Japanese. So there's a huge Japanese kind of retirement community in Southeast Asia because costs are lower. You, it's easier to get um, home help. Nursing homes are cheaper and so on. So that is another option. But again, you know, moving to an, a new country when you're 60, 70 is not ideal either, right? So, yeah, it is definitely worth keeping in mind. I'm planning to stay in Japan, barring, you know, alien invasions or, you know, a new nuclear accident or something. But I do have contingency plans, you know, if, you know, this is, this is, I have kind of an idea what I would do if I had to leave. Um, but a lot of people don't. So a lot of people kind of assume that the, the current situation is going to continue. And in my experience, that is a, a foolish assumption. So then in your mind, to what extent should people have those contingency plans? Because some personalities prefer to not think about those things altogether. Others might, um, for lack of a better word, become obsessed with trying to protect against every eventuality that could possibly happen, including alien invasions. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I, I mean, I have plan X, you know, <laughs> A, B, C, D, E, F, like, I mean, obviously it depends on the person, you know, but uh Things like having appropriate insurance, you know, like if you have a family, you should probably have life insurance. If you drive, you should have car insurance. And basically, yeah, just just being aware that things might go wrong. So that's why we need an emergency fund, for example. If you don't have three to six months worth of living expenses in the bank in cash, um, that's probably something you should focus on. Uh, and by focus on, I mean, not like think about idly, but treat it as an emergency. So if you haven't got cash savings to, to, deal, to help you through emergencies, you should basically stop spending money until you do. So don't go out to eat, don't go on holiday, don't buy anything that's not essential until you have some cash in the bank. And then ignore that cash and don't spend it and go back to normal kind of lifestyle. It's, I don't know if you know uh, Mr. Money Mustache. Yeah, the blogger. So he he used to write a lot about kind of punching people in the face if they were kind of being obtuse uh, uh, and uh, spending emergency. So basically, not having your finances in order is kind of like your hair being on fire. You know, you have to stop doing everything and just deal with it. And then, you know, you can go back to other kind of normal activities. But I agree with that kind of harsh, you know, harsh uh, kind of attitude. It's a bit like in the Shawshank Redemption, that scene in the library where the guy's like, you know, I I've never been good at studying. It's like, well, go away. Stop wasting my time. Right? <laughs> You've got to help yourself. 
at the end of the day. I mean, obviously with my, my sites, I, I do talk to a lot of people about money. Uh, and occasionally you run into people who just make excuses, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I'd like to, but this and this and this. Well, at the end of the day, it's your life, you know, you're going to suffer the consequences of, of not being prepared. Like I will help you if you're willing to take action, but some people you just can't reach. Yeah, so. definitely. But maybe one of the reasons people avoid saving money like that is because they don't want to think about the bad things that could happen. So do you have any examples of times that three to six months of savings could be useful apart from a loss of a job? Yeah, I mean, so I, I had to go into hospital for three weeks last year, um, had surgery, and that was fine. But you know, if you can't work for three weeks, and you haven't got enough paid leave, you're gonna have to unpaid leave, that's gonna reduce your salary. And then you know, if, if you're just living paycheck to paycheck, where your salary just about covers your expenses, aside from the cost of the medical treatment itself, um, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, you're going to be tapping your credit card or, you know, borrowing money from friends. Or, and that's not a good situation to be in. If you've got a car, you know, your car, you, ha you have a problem with your car where you need to pay 200, 300,000 yen to fix it. How are you going to pay for that? You, could, you, could you pay for that if that suddenly happened tomorrow? There's all sorts of things you should, you know, you, you could have some kind of accident where you're liable for someone else. So yeah, there there are many, many, many situations where having an extra month's wages in the bank is, is going to be the difference between, you know, it not really affecting you and it becoming this huge stressful problem that's going to drag on for months. So, mm -hmm. And at least thinking about some of my peers on the JET program, I get the sense that it's a little bit hard to save money because the culture of depending on where you are, but in some areas, it's very much everybody gets the same salary. So everybody kind of has the same idea of how much money people have on hand at any given time. So it's very much a culture of, oh, we just got paid. So let's go spend all of it. So do you have any advice for people who might have a hard time setting those financial boundaries with others who may be aware of what your actual financial situation is. So it's not like you can say, oh, I, I don't have money. We know you have money. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, for me, the easiest way to save is to, you know, it's the pay yourself first idea where on payday, you take however much money you've decided you're going to save and you put it somewhere else and it's gone. So you don't have it anymore. Um, and if you do that and, and stick to it, then that makes it pretty easy to save. The other thing is to, to maybe separate socializing and spending money because there's all sorts of ways to socialize that don't involve spending money. You know, you know, you can go drinking in a bar or you can drink up in the park with your friends. You know, like that's a, you're allowed to do that here in Japan, luckily. So. Or, you, you know, going for a walk is is fun for a lot of people, you know, going to the beach and playing football on the sand or whatever. You know, these are all free activities. Um, that also involves socializing, but don't involve money. So I think it, it's quite easy for people to kind of default to let's go out for dinner, let's go to a club, you know, let's go to USJ or whatever. Uh, but you don't need to. You can still hang out with people and have fun. And, and often you can have more fun with kind of spontaneous non-money kind of activities like going hiking and getting lost is, is more memorable than going out drinking again kind of thing. So... That would be my advice. You know, if you're on a tight budget, you're basically, you're trying to reduce your spending without reducing your quality of life. So you want to enjoy your life as much as you can while still kind of being ready for eventualities and, and, and getting ready for the future. So it's just a, a case of being creative and figuring out what you enjoy doing and then just, you know, making these small changes over time. Mm -hmm. That definitely makes a lot of sense. So apart from pension and obviously keeping up with your various insurances, are there any other special considerations that people should keep in mind when dealing with their personal finance situation in Japan? Well, one thing that I think is essential um, is that Americans need to understand how their situation works in terms of taxes. So... I, I often, yeah, I'm not American, uh, and I kind of, I, I'm kind of annoyed that I have to go around teaching Americans about how their rules work because the IRS hasn't done so. 
But I really think Americans should get a little packet when they leave the country that says, you know, these are the the special rules that apply to you. Be aware of this stuff. But they don't. eh? So first thing is that U.S. citizens are taxed by because of their nationality. Um, Whereas pretty much everywhere else in the world, you're taxed by your residence. So as a UK citizen, I'm not I don't have to declare or pay taxes to the UK unless I live there. So I live in Japan. I have to pay taxes in Japan because I live in Japan. I don't have to pay taxes to the UK. It's very clear. All I have to do is follow Japan's rules. But for Americans, they have to follow American rules and Japan and Japanese rules at the same time. And they don't play nicely together. So for Americans, the main thing is that it's probably not a good idea to invest in Japan. So if you're a US citizen and you want to start investing, the, the easiest way to do so is just to use an existing account in the US or try to open a new one. There's a few brokers that will work with non-residents and just invest there normally, you know, buy ETFs, you know, buy uh, cheap diversified ETFs and just do it that way. So what are ETFs just for people who aren't familiar with trading? Right. So an ETF is it's an exchange traded fund. It's basically a a bag of investments. So an ETF is normally based on some kind of index like the S&P 500, which are the 500 biggest com- companies in the US. And all that means is that within the, the bag, um, they bought all these companies and then you can buy a piece of the bag without having to go out yourself and buy each company individually. And what this gives you is it gives you diversification. So all your investments are not in one thing. You're spread across all these different companies in different sectors And so on average, your investments are going to grow um, kind of more steadily than they would do if you were picking individual stocks where they they might do well, they might do badly. If you buy the index, you'll generally do okay over time. So this is what everyone recommends doing. (laughs) So every person who's not trying to sell you something is going to say, yeah, just buy cheap index funds. Right. Anything that's expensive, it's probably going to be eating up whatever returns you got for mo- in most situations. Yeah. So you want to you be careful with the fees. And ETFs in the US have can, can have very low fees. So we're talking 0.1% in fees, that kind of level. You don't want to be paying much more than that. Yeah, definitely. And if you're a little bit more curious about that, you mentioned Mr. Money Mustache before, and that's probably a really good place for people to go to get started on the basic financial education. <laughs> yeah, so he's he's got a really entertaining style. I'd recommend going back and reading his early posts because he's kind of almost graduated from blogging about money now. Also, there's a forum called the Bogleheads Forum. So this is a really good place to to kind of read about evidence-based investing for normal people. And these are people that are fans of John Bogle, who started Vanguard and kind of created the kind of index fund as a commercial proposition. Mm-hmm. And Vanguard is, an, is one of the companies that a lot of places recommend. They do. But if you're overseas, you can't open a new account with Vanguard, unfortunately. But you can buy their products through other brokers. So... so- then are there any other things that you think people just might not be aware of in terms of extra things they can do to save money or earn money or be more effective when investing money while living in Japan? Well, I'm a big fan of doing side jobs if you can. Uh, And obviously, you've got to be careful with your visa. So you've got to make sure that you're allowed to do the job in question. Then you have to be careful with your employer. There's this thing where you're you're supposed to get permission from your employer to do work in some conditions based on your contract, basically. So that's something to keep in mind. A lot of the dispatch ALT companies are quite happy for people to do side work because they don't really pay them enough. So (laughs) they kind of assume that people have to do side work if they want to actually survive. And the visa thing, you can always get special permission to work, you know, at a specified job for a certain number of hours. So even if, so for example, a lot of ALTs will be on an instructor visa and an instructor visa doesn't allow you to work for private language schools, for example, it's just for working in public schools, but it's quite easy to go to immigration and get permission to work, you know, five hours a week, 10 hours a week at a, maybe an Aikawa school or, or something like that. Now, pretty much the whole time I've been in Japan, I've had two or three jobs and it's been really good, not just in terms of earning money, but also in terms of getting experience and trying new things and, and 
kind of developing my career, as it were. So I really do recommend going out and finding things that you're interested in that can get you some money and maybe get you some experience as well. And those special permissions on your visa, are you able to do those for more entrepreneurial activities or is it typically something through a more official employer? If you want to do entrepreneurial stuff, unfortunately, I think you need like a a business visa which can be quite hard to get, or you need to be on a spouse visa or permanent resident visa, which allow you to do any kind of work you want. Um, Special permission tends to be, yeah, it's basically a a, a salaried or a contracted thing where you're working for someone. Um, If you wanted to start your own business or, or freelance, that's much more difficult. So are there any things that people may not be aware of in terms of saving money? Any areas that might be easy to overlook for people? Well, for (laughs) non-Americans, Japan recently has been creating uh, ways to incentivize people to invest. So the two main ones are NISA, which is a tax-free investment account, and IDECO, which is a kind of tax-advantaged retirement account. And both of those are really good. So NISA means that you can invest a certain amount every year and it won't be taxed. So if you make a profit, you won't have to pay capital gains tax. And Iveco allows you to invest pre-tax income. So anything you put into the Iveco account reduces your taxable income, so you pay less income taxes now. And both of those are great. Um, Iveco is basically, if you're planning to stay here, basically, you should be using Iveco to supplement your pension in retirement. And if you're going to be here for five, ten years, then Nisa is a great idea. The thing about um, Iveco is that your, your money is locked away, so you can't access it until you're 60. But NISA, you can get it back anytime. Those are the two main areas I'd, I'd recommend looking at if you're getting started with investing and you think you've got a, a, a medium to long-term future in Japan. If you're only here for a couple of years, I probably wouldn't bother investing in Japan because it's quite a hassle to open the accounts and get everything set up. Instead, either save up and take the money back with you when you leave or try to open an account in you know your home country or your base country Uh, and start investing that way. But either way, I would recommend starting to invest as soon as possible with small amounts of money. Because only by taking action can we actually learn, you know, how it works and how we feel about it and how, you know, we react to market conditions and so on. So starting with, you know, a tiny amount of money, like 5,000 yen a month, 10,000 yen a month, starting to invest, opening the account, getting used to it, means that, you know, later on when we have more money, will know what to do rather than starting later on when you've got less time and more pressure and mistakes matter more. So it's much better to start as soon as possible because the younger you are, the, the less important those first few years are in terms of returns. Yeah. And especially for people who are just getting started looking at ETFs, even just in that specific genre of investing, there's so many options. So where would you suggest that people start, even if they're just trying to build the habit in the first place? Generally, I would I would recommend going with really diversified indexes. So the world stock market. You know, if you if you buy an index fund, whether that's an ETF or in Japan, mutual funds are slightly better. Um, if you buy the world economy. Basically, your investment thesis is that over time, the world economy is likely to grow. So you don't know which country is going to grow. You don't know what's going to happen, which sector is going to do well. But if you own all of it, on average, you'll probably get some kind of growth. And that's the most stable way to approach things, I think. Now, if, for Americans, many people like to stick to the US stock market because it's made up of global companies. So effectively, you're kind of buying the world. But for people from outside the US, I think the global stock market is a good option. Or you could buy the US stock market. That's fine, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard it both ways as well. So would you mind telling us a little bit more about what it was like starting your own company? Was the motivation for that just to avoid ending up in the same situation as before where you lost where you unfortunately lost your contract or how did you decide to become an entrepreneur it kind of happened naturally so i was doing various different side projects which for me include writing uh, and running retired japan uh, and i helped my wife with her english school so those various projects all 
kind of came together and I was like, okay, so I'll just do this stuff now. I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to start a company and therefore my company is going to do this. It was more like, I'm already writing all this stuff. So I'm just going to do that from now on. I don't actually have an incorporated company either. Um, I'm just a sole proprietor, I guess you'd call it. Uh, and my wife is too, even though her company is quite big. She's got almost a dozen employees, but she, she hasn't incorporated it yet. So then how are you able to make money as a as a small sole proprietor? Is it mostly through your writing or are you able to offer consultations with people? How does that usually work for you? Yeah, I mean, so I kind of retired actually this year. So I was working in university until the end of March and um, I got to the end of my contract. The university decided not to renew it again. So again, I'm unemployed, but this time it was okay. So we kind of sat down and said, i I. I'm luckily now I don't need to look for another job. So I'll just keep doing kind of my side projects. So Retired Japan's mostly free. I do look at it as a public service mostly. Uh, it's basically trying to help the community. So 90% of it, I would say, is free. And then it's there's a slight monetized bit where, you know, we do sell a couple of ebooks. Uh, I do offer personal coaching to people one on one. Um, we started running a course this year, kind of online cohort based course. Um, but other than that, everything's free on the site. So it's not particularly well monetized. <laughs> I keep having people contact me and say, hey, we'll help you monetize your site because you're leaving so much money on the table. I'm like, yeah, I don't really. That's not the idea. You know, that's not why we're doing this. So. And then I've also written some English textbooks that we set, we self publish and my wife's school does quite well. So. That's how we kind of float around now. So, Just for people who may be new to the idea of retirement before the official retirement age at 60 or 65, there's, of course, the whole FIRE movement, which is financial independence, retire early, which is a little bit controversial depending on who you ask. But would you mind just telling us a little bit more about what financial independence is? So... Yeah, this this has all sorts. I mean, there's there's hundreds of different definitions. Pretty much everyone has their own image of what that means. I think for most people, it would be when you no longer need to work for money. So it's not necessarily whether you choose to or not. It's whether you could live off your investments or your savings. Uh, and most people try basically use the 4% rule to kind of try and guesstimate that. So they look at their investments and they say you know if you can live off four percent of your investments that's likely to support you for at least 30 years based on some studies that were done in i think the 80s and 90s and that's a good rule of thumb because actually in the real world what happens is that you adjust you know so it's not so much that you have some mathematical certainty that you know, 4% of your investments will support you forever. But more like if, if it something happens and that's no longer the case, you'll just go back to work, you know, or you'll spend less or, you know. So people adjust, I think. And that's how people survive retirement when they're not ready for it. You know, if you get to retirement and you haven't got enough money, you're going to get by somehow, basically. You know, you'll, you'll basically reduce your standard of living or you'll do part-time work or you'll find some way of, of muddling through, so... I think it's the same for financially independent people. I think technically we're on uh, coast fire, I think they call it. So you you have enough invested, which means that you don't need to work as hard anymore. You no longer need to invest for the future, but you kind of work enough to support your lifestyle and allow your investments to continue growing until you need them. So we haven't touched our investments yet we don't we haven't needed to so we're just going to let them roll for a little bit longer and see see how we go for me it was more of a psychological issue rather than a money issue we kind of about last year we kind of realized that we had kind of had enough money now but after that it then became okay so what do we do with our time what does our day look like you know what's our goal what kind of life do you want and in some ways, that's more difficult than the money issue, because if you've got a job, you have to get up in the morning, you have to go to work, you got all these kind of outside imposed kind of deadlines and goals and so on. But it, once that goes away, you're kind of you're responsible for all of that now. So it's quite interesting. Um, it's It's been a fun process trying to figure out what, what a day should look like. 
Now, has that been a very satisfying process for you? Has it been stressful at any time or has it has it been helpful to have somebody as a partner who's kind of on the same page as you? It's been great. <laughs> I can't I can't lie. It's been wonderful actually. Yeah. So, I mean, not having to get up in the morning is nice. You know, and then being able to structure your day however you want to is is also really good. So I basically, I don't have any fixed things in my week. So I've got projects that I'm working on. You know, I help out with the school in a managerial kind of way. I'm writing a bunch of things. But every day you can pretty much wake up and say, okay, I'm going to do this today. Uh, And that is, that is, for me, that is the real benefit of, financial strength where you know you don't necessarily need to have a day job just that kind of the freedom it gives you the optionality it gives you where your choices are no longer dictated by money but more by your other values so what what you enjoy doing what you think is valuable what you can contribute to i i that i'm mean, that's part of my kind of motivation for running retired japan i want to help more people get here because I think most people should be able to. Like um, the course we started this year is called Your First 10 Million Yen. And the idea is that we'll take people who are just getting started with personal finance and we'll give them the information and the kind of motivation and the support that they need to save and invest their way to 10 million yen. Uh, And I chose 10 million yen because it's big enough to be significant but it's achievable. I think most people who aren't, you know, at poverty level should be able to save and invest their way to 10 million yen eventually. You know, it might take five years, it might take 10 years, but you can get there. You know, it's it's an achievable goal. And once you have 10 million yen, it's it's quite easy to get 20. You know, once you figure out how to do it and you you adjust your lifestyle accordingly and you get your way to 10 million yen, uh, then 20s much easier 30 and so on so that's kind of the the beginning so yeah that's that's our new mission i guess try and get as many people to financial strength independence security as possible i can see how that would be so important and getting people over that first hill is definitely the hardest one because after that you have compounding growth and you already have all the systems in place so whatever you can do to get people to that first level is is very invaluable i think So then if you were chatting with somebody who was hoping to move to Japan to live and work, uh, but they didn't really know anything about the country, its culture, the language, maybe what to expect when they got there, what would you advise that person to learn before they come? Well, I'd, I'd probably try and ask them some questions and figure out why they wanted to do that. Because I think... More so now than when I came here. I think there's a lot of people who have kind of unrealistic expectations about Japan. You know, they have an image of what Japan is like, about what life in Japan is like. Uh, you know, that it's it's better than the, what they have now. Uh, and I I would kind of advise people to be careful with that because Japan is not better than wherever you are right now. It's It's different it's interesting it's it's fun some people love it here and some people don't love it here but that would be my beginning you know just to try and make sure that they have kind of realistic expectations and they have a a realistic plan for living in japan because you know the the employment situation if you don't have marketable skills and if you don't have japanese language is not great (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's a lot of people who who end up very very frustrated if they come here and don't have marketable skills basically and don't uh, don't acquire them because that's the other you can come here and build up your skills and end up with a reasonable career and, and a reasonable life but if you don't do that you know then four or five years in you're still doing entry-level jobs at, at minimum salaries and and people get very jaded and and end up very unhappy so in terms of learning, I mean, I came here with zero Japanese. So I, I came here and I could say Atsi this and there, which is great because it was August and it was really Atsi. But I, I have a background in languages, so I picked up Japanese quite quickly and that, that really helped. 
Yeah, my main thing would be just make sure that you you have a realistic expectation of what your life's going to be like, about your kind of prospects and about what you're going to have to do if you want to make a, a go of things here. So you don't get to come here and live in, you know, some anime, I guess. <laughs> Shocking, I know. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing your time and insights today. I think it'll be really helpful for people who might have been procrastinating on getting their financial house in order I feel like it's even easier to put off when you move abroad because you have so many other things to worry about. So I really appreciate you taking the time to speak today. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So if anyone actually, you know, is, is interested in learning more or getting started, then please come to the Retired Japan website. We have a really active forum where you can get, you know, advice and encouragement and, and people are nice. It's a very nice place. So. Great. Definitely looking forward to seeing some people on there. Yeah. Glad to see those communities on the internet thriving, not getting drowned out by any sort of negativity. That's always great to see. Is there anything that you wish that we had talked about a little bit more or that you wish I had asked you in today's conversation? No, I think we, I think we covered quite a lot there. I mean, basically, the I, I might just finish by, by kind of explaining the how to get started with personal finance. And it's very, very simple. There's only four things you need to do. So you need to increase your income and you need to reduce your spending as much as you can without reducing your quality of life. Uh, and you need to start investing in something sensible. And you need to have the appropriate insurance for your situation. And if you can do those four things, even a little, um, it'll make a huge difference to your life over time. So... That would be my advice. Yeah, definitely. Today. Definitely such a great place for everyone to get started. So thank you again. All right. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed today's conversation. Be sure to check out the links in the description of this episode to learn more about Ben and his company, Retire Japan. There is so much more to learn from the free resources he makes available, and I can't recommend it enough. If you enjoyed today's episode, Go ahead and share it with a friend, colleague, or connection on LinkedIn to help spread the perspectives and information shared in the podcast. And please remember to go ahead and subscribe or follow on whatever platform you're using, and also leave a rating and review if you enjoyed the podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, please check out my link to the show's coffee page to keep me well caffeinated and making content. As always, feel free to email me at businesssuccessjapan at gmail.com if you have any other questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes or interview topics. I'd love to hear from you directly, so if you'd like to leave a voice message, you can find a link to do that in the description as well. But for now, remember that the more you learn, the more confident you will become as you explore all of the opportunities Japan has to offer you. Until next time, mata kondo.